Oh, you're waiting for that. Sorry. Just give me a thumbs up when you're live. Oh. I will call the meeting to order. Um, tonight, before we jump into the Pledge of Allegiance, tonight's a very exciting night. We have a couple of celebrations. And my favorite part of school committee meetings, the return of the big check. So this is an exciting night. Um, so we're going to start off, if you're able, join me and stand and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. everybody and welcome. I am going to uh, turn this part of the meeting over to Mrs. Latender. It is, um, we are back with a student showcase which is very exciting and this one is an extraordinarily exciting showcase. So Mrs. Latender, I will turn it over to you. Good evening. Hello, Mr. Lynch, school committee chairman, Mr. Young, and the school committee and members of the audience out there. I'm very excited to present to you today some of our students engaged in an IXL math challenge in April. So I have a little, a uh, few slides to show you tonight, and I have a few students in the audience I'd like to recognize. Unfortunately, they all were not here. First of all, I just want to tell you a little bit about IXL. It is an online platform that allows students to explore and learn various math concepts aligned to Massachusetts state standards. And Nichols Middle School started using IXL about three years ago. IXL offers hundreds of math skills for teachers to use for assignments and assessments. Teachers can also personalize the skill plan to align to our state standards. IXL's real-time diagnostic pinpoints students' grade level proficiency in key math areas. And then teachers can use that data to help drive their instruction and see where their strengths and weaknesses are and adjust their teaching accordingly. 
Um, this has been a great tool to identify some of the learning gaps that we've had um, that have happened over COVID-19 because the teachers in math would set up some skill assessments, a diagnostic test just to see where students are at. And um, so we, we use it in various ways in our school, but our sixth grade teacher, Mr. Lapino, he wanted to um, enter the IXL April Math Challenge, and so he asked for some student volunteers. So I don't know how many of them volunteered or were asked, but we had 10 students participate all of April. So it was a worldwide contest, and they participated in the category for grades five through eight based on their grade level. And students were motivated to compete and practice, enhance their math skills, and it's a fun way to learn sometimes when you're in a competition or a little contest and you want to beat others. So it was an intrinsic goal and motivator. And then there were some specific rules to the contest that Mr. Lapino um, looked up and made sure he articulated that to the group of students who volunteered. Unfortunately, Mr. Lapino could not be here tonight. He was at the baseball game because he is an assistant coach for the Nichols Middle School. And I know they were away today. No, they actually were home. Um, so they had to answer questions um, from grades three through 12, um, in including skills from geometry, algebra one, algebra two, pre-calculus, and calculus. Um, but there was, they could not answer um, any more than 50 questions per skill, and they couldn't have more than five incorrect questions per skill. So this means they couldn't repeat a skill once a student reaches a SMART score of 100, and they probably could explain this part of the contest better than I can. And a SMART score is a progress score, not a percentage score, and most SMART scores of 100 can be reached in about 25 correct answers. So there's a whole formula of how they com complete all their math problems and then earn their points and then move to the next skill. So who participated? If I call your name, you can come on up and stand with me because I think you should be recognized. So Morgan Tripp, I know she's not here, Molly Kosinski, Braden Morris, come on up, and your brother Aiden Morris, <laughs> Luke Bulldog, <laughs> Kennedy Frawley. They deserve a big round of applause, all the work. Wait till you see the numbers. And Jake Landon, Darren Fitzgibbons, and David Bumpus. So out of the 10 students, we have these four wonderful students who were able to join us tonight. And they worked really hard because wait till you see what they did. So I took a picture this morning. I was trying to get everybody because a couple of weeks ago, we had a pizza party for them. And they got certificates and medals. Jake has his medal on, um, proudly wearing his medal. So. Our students accomplished a lot, actually. If you look at the numbers of what they, comp the number of problems they comp um, completed, Morgan Tripp had over 15,000 questions alone that she answered. Um, and if you look at the categories, she did, had over 14,000 worth skills in grades three through 12, but 198 of those went up to Algebra 1, Geometry, Pre-Calculus, and Calculus type questions as a sixth grader. And then they do subtract if you go over the skills, 50 per skill. So you'll see that in Molly's where she went over 140 problems and they take that away from her total number that she did to give her her total answers um, of 9,017. And then Brandon had 5,797 math questions he answered and Aiden had 5,510. Did you have a friendly competition between the two of you? No? <laughs> I have twins, so I understand. <laughs> um, and then Luke had 5,159 math questions, and then Kennedy had 3,561, and then you can see all the numbers going down, and Jake had 3,211. But they had a grand total of 55,860 math problems that they solved together between the 10 of them, which is pretty amazing, and that was during the month of April. And Congratulations for all your hard work and dedication. Did, did you have a favorite part? <laughs> no? Did you have a hard problem you didn't like? No? <laughs> Do you just love math? All right, I love that. Love that you love math. All right, and so 
we had a pizza party. Not all the students could participate there, so then I tried to get another picture of everybody this morning, but we had a few students absent. So they got, we gave them certificates and medals, and Mr. Lupino's wife and him put together nice treat bags for them because we thought they definitely earned some huge recognition because, and there's our pizza party, and they, be, they came in first place in Massachusetts, second place in the United States, and fifth place in the world, and were there were over 33,000 um, schools registered in this contest. So that's pretty awesome. Yay. You should be very, very proud of yourselves. That's a lot of work. Are you gonna skip right to eighth grade math, you think, next year? Would you do the contest again? Yeah? Awesome, I love that, that's the best. So honestly, they had over 5,000 questions if you average that out between the 10 of them and that's a lot of work. And so we're very proud of them and uh, we're happy to have them be part of Team Nichols and we can't thank Mr. Lupino enough for organizing this wonderful event for our students. So great job, guys. Maybe someday we'll get our math team back at Nichols Middle School. All right, they would be good candidates, I think. And that's it for our presentation, but congratulations. I don't know if anyone has any questions. I, I do for them. Does anyone want to talk to us? <laughs> I know that's the hardest part, They're but I figured I'd ask. <laughs> Come right here. Come on. Goodbye, Mrs. Latent. You guys can head up. So my first question to you guys is, was it all hard work or was there some fun involved? There's some fun. <laughs> and did you guys realize how many questions you answered? Were you keeping track of that or was it sort of amazing at the end when you found out the total number? <laughs> Anyone? It was like amazing at the end when we found out the number. Were you shocked by the number of questions you all actually answered? Yes. I have a question. When you were doing the math problems, did it keep track of how many you were doing so you knew? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Say that again? So you could check your status, personal status? Could you check the, the team no. status? No. Oh, so they didn't even know what the others were doing, but they could check the You'll go right ahead, Rich. So how many are you going to do next year? <laughs> <laughs> what would be your goal for next year after this year? Huh? You don't know? <laughs> <laughs> Just a lot, right? A lot more, yeah. So did Mr. Eddie recruit you guys as a group of students, or did you students recruit Mr. Eddie and say, hey, we could put, put a team together that could win? A little bit of both? Yeah. OK. Well, congratulations to all of you. This is awesome. Yeah. What a great accomplishment on behalf of the entire Middlebrook Public Schools. Yep. Thank you. Fantastic job, everybody. Yeah. And work. thank you for representing our school system because you represent it as much as any team. So thank you very much. We appreciate it. Great and job, guys. how many of you, is this your first time here yeah. <laughs> inside this building? No. If you go down the hall by Mr. Brannigan's office, you'll see a group of signs. And one of the signs is every year at graduation here, Mr. Brannigan gives an award to the number one math student here. And we have a pretty good math team here too. And so if you come here, when you make sure you sign up for the math team, because you probably all could do really, really well, okay? Thank you, everybody. We're off to a great start. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Latunda. We are extraordinarily proud of all of you, so thank you very much. Um, I'm going to turn the next one over to uh, Mr. Lynch. Sure. Because that's the, um, the big check department, and like I said, that's my favorite part as a school committee member. And I will pass the baton in turn to Mr. Thompson. Derek Thompson is the principal of the Henry B. Birkeland School, has been working with our local Rotary Club for a number of years uh, on a program called Rotary Raise. He'll explain the program. Uh, alongside him is Mr. Jamie O'Brien, who's a fifth grade teacher at the Mary Kay Good School, who helped to direct and organize this after school program, which basically extends the school day
for a number of students who are identified as uh, a group that could definitely use the, the extra help. So, Mr. Thompson and Mr. O'Brien, we welcome you. And I know you're getting some video set here. And here we go. So, welcome, Derek. Yeah, thank you. There we go. Thank you for having us tonight. I'm really just here to introduce Mr. O'Brien. This has been his show this year. I think this is our eighth year. We were just trying to figure this out. Mr. O'Brien's been a tutor since the beginning of the program. And um, this year, because we were able to expand the program with some funding from the district to match funding that we got from the Rotary, we were able to expand it um, to 14 tutors and to have Mr. O'Brien step up as the coordinator of the program. So it's been really good. So I've been pretty much hands off. We're going to introduce some Rotary members when he's done. And, um, but he's going to take us through a little slideshow and uh, show us all the work he's done this year. Hey, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the Rotary Club for their continued support in this endeavor because, uh, as you'll see in a couple minutes, it's been a pretty meaningful experience for a lot of kids. Um, and it was, it was kind of a downtime when we lost it in, in the coronavirus year. So I was really happy to get it back this year. Um, we got off a little to a little late start this year, but um, it ended the way it always does on a really positive note. So I'll go through the slides. If you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to, to interject and ask me, um, or you can wait till the end, whatever you prefer. Um, so the Rotary Rays Club is an after school program, as Mr. Lynch had did, that's uh, for math and ELA. And as Derek said, this year we got to expand it a little bit. So now we're able to get from second grade to fifth grade with it. Oh, okay, awesome, thanks. What about, what about hit the link? With the, with the red, okay. So it's, a, it's an after school program that's 15 one hour sessions and most of the sessions will meet once to twice a week. There are two tutors for every 12 students and the focus again is, is ELA and math. It's been a collaboration between the Middleborough Rotary Club and the Middleborough Schools for about eight years now. Um, it's been a fantastic program. There are kids in this high school that have been through it, and uh, I'll actually get to a part of that in just a minute. Our vision for the tutoring sessions is to really st help strengthen confidence, and I think supporting what you just presented a few minutes ago, a lot of kids who feel horrible in math aren't because they're horrible in math, they just don't realize that it's not as hard as they think. And, and when you can find a way to show them to look at it through a different window, you can change the way they feel about it. And that's part of what's happened through this program and the opportunities we've had in this program. Um, our focus is to often pre-teach what homeroom teachers are going to do because that's a really big confidence builder for that kid that's struggling with concepts to, to be able to go into the homeroom and have a sort of advanced idea of what's going on before the other kids in the class. Um, now they sort of feel like they're moving ahead. And, and I want to say, I'm not sure if it's anywhere in here, but another thing to note about this program is that we're picking subjects that students who struggle with are, are, are choosing to stay after school and take time after school, after they just finish school, to stay and do more of the subject that they probably like the least. So there's a lot of commitment that's involved in what we're doing too. And it comes from both the schools and the family. So I have a few um, documents, some of the master documents that we use to, to sort of guide the program. How'd you open them? <laughs> that one actually, can you try the one under it? That's okay. That one's from year five, so it might not even make sense. Okay. Well, so the first two slides were really how we choose our criteria to, to get the students involved in the program, basically based on their STAR 360 and their, and their MCAS scoring. Um, and the teachers get a, a referral sheet where they look through their data, they figure some students to make recommendations, and they start reaching out to parents to try and see who would be interested in getting involved. Because again, it is a, it is a commitment. Um, 
This year, uh, I've been trying to do this for a few years. This year, the, what you're looking at right now is we reached out to the high school to try and see if we could get some volunteer high school students to come down and be supportive in the program as well. And because this year started off late, it wasn't anything that was sort of mandatory. We sort of went to the tutors and said, if you're interested, let us know and we'll put out slots. And, and we got a pretty good response. I would say half of the tutors got involved and, and we had some students from the high school come down. So um, a great way for them to earn their community service and a great way for us to get some good peer role models in there for the students to see. So we're hoping next year to expand that a little bit more as we go through too and that might also give us a window to open up more spots for more students as well. And I'm not sure if the other documents are gonna link, but I know the good stuff is gonna link because he said he looked at it earlier, right? Okay, cool. Um, our attendance for this year, uh, we had pretty good attendance considering everything that was going on because we really didn't start till after Christmas and it was really when that six season starting kicking in and, and most of our attendances were above 90% throughout the program. So that's a really good turnout again for kids who are coming after school for something that's not their favorite thing, not by choice as much. So <coughs> it was a good turnout. Um, some photos, grade two and grade three mostly focused on ELA. Um, grade four and five were focusing a little bit more in math. Um, but the students were really actively involved in what was going on and there were lots of hands-on activities. So like in this ELA, the students made game boards to take home and it was things that they could review that they were doing and practice their skills at home. Yeah, I'm not sure of the data if it will open. Uh, fourth grade math, again, lots of hands-on activities the kids were into. Um, and I mean, if you look at them, they're having fun. And that was one of the big things about the program. They're, they're staying after school and they're having fun and they enjoyed it. Uh, I wonder if this one would link, this one might link in. Oh. So I can explain that data though. In the math, it's a little bit easier to, to assess because we just do a pretest and then we do a post-test and, and we look at where they, they fell. And what that data shows there that I apologize we can't get that open for you is um, the students in their beginning scores were really low. And we had a couple students who ended up opting out because if, if you have too many absences, we tend to try to get somebody else in the program that's gonna fill the slots because this is a great program and we wanna make sure it's getting used effectively. Um, so some of the kids will start after the initial testing and may not get there. The testing for our fifth grade, every student's increase was anywhere between probably 25 and 75 percent and their scores between pre-test and post-test, except we had three kids that didn't finish it at all. And I found that to be a, fin that to me was more achieving than almost the score increases because when we did the initial test, they were all done in like 10 minutes. And they had almost two sessions to finish this test the second time. If they didn't finish, they were trying. They were putting effort in. They could have just been done with it really quick, moved on, not care what their score was, but they were applying an effort to try and do something to try and, and try and get a better score. So even though they didn't actually finish the test in the time that we had for them to do it, there was a huge accomplishment for them to be able to apply that much effort to what they were doing. Because in the beginning, they wouldn't even have thought twice about doing that in math. So, it, and, and their progress shows in their face, in the work that they're doing in the classrooms, and in a lot of the comments we hear from parents. Um, the first comments here were from a, a, a teacher that was, had a couple students in. It says, the first student was not confident in their ability to do some of the math we were working on, and having the opportunity to work with skills that we hadn't gotten to was very helpful. The second student hated doing math, which is a very common word in the program, uh, was very unsure of how to do it and, and complained regularly about math in general, going to rotary rays in particular. After a couple weeks, the student was looking forward to the sessions, became more confident in how to use math skills specifically, overall math in general, and the confidence in doing math work increased dramatically. 
Um, we got a, a note from a parent. I received an email from this student's mom and wanted to share it. I believe this was a, a third grade. Thank you so much for helping her build her confidence in making Rotary Race such a great experience for her. She's begun reading every night on her own without us asking her to read. Her confidence has risen and we're seeing a difference in her ability to write a complete paragraph. I wish we could have her in this every year. And uh, another teacher had sent information as she explained the extra reinforcement of math concept. I noticed a greater level of confidence during our math block. Not only was she more successful in solving problems, she was willing to raise her hand and offer answers during whole class sessions. It was wonderful. And this is that confidence that I'm talking about that's going to drive more students into feeling like they can do it. And I think that's the biggest accomplishment this program has, has offered in the eight years that I've seen it. Um, that kids come back and, and I've had kids come back and say, I'm, I'm getting all A's in math. And they're in middle school and they're stoked because when they were in fifth grade, they hated it. And they couldn't do it and they weren't good at it and that was just the way it was. And this program helped us give them an opportunity to see it a different way. And it's been really powerful that way. So the more students we can reach with this, the better off we're gonna be. So I really appreciate uh, Mr. Lynch and the district support and, and doubling what we've been doing and adding to this as we go because it has been a pretty powerful tool. So to end that, I do have a couple videos I'd like to show you that are testimonials from the students. Um, so this will kind of give you a, a, a straight voice from them. All right, so Eliza, if they let you do Rotary Rays again next year, would you want to? Yes. Why would you want to do it again? Because it helps me learn and help, and it helps me um, share with other classmates and, um, and it will, um, and it will ma make me a better writer. And awesome. All right. Thanks, Eliza. You're all right, so Eliza, if they let you do Rotary Rays again next year. <laughs> That's why I'm letting you do it. Okay, so how do Rotary Rays help you? It helped me by making me feel like I'm better at math, and it wanted me, it made me want to do more math, and um, I wouldn't be like, I don't know how to explain it, but like not be, not be like, afraid to be wrong in that. Okay. Um, I like that it will help me in math because I didn't know my multiplication tables, but once we got more into it, I kind of started to know them and I don't really it's a good feeling, yeah? Mm -hmm. and, um... <coughs> so, kind of tried to give you a view from everybody's perspective, from the teachers, the parents, and from the students. <coughs> and I hopefully answer any questions if you have any. Mr. Jeff? Um, this has been one of the great programs that, especially from the rotary um, that came to us um, and it's one of the those programs that time and time again I know we don't have a lot of data because of everything that happened but time and time again Derek you keep coming to us and explaining how this program is affecting kids and how it's changing their lives and um, I can't emphasize enough how how grateful we are to the rotary for their continued sponsorship and them really bringing the program forward and helping us. Um, and personally, I think the Rotary, um, aside from MASBA, is one of the outside groups that give the most uh, to our community and especially our school system. So we, we can't thank you enough. Um, and Derek, uh, can you talk a little about how test scores change over time? Yeah, for sure. I think we, we can very confidently say that this program has worked 
really well over the over the years. We have seen we have tended to look at growth numbers. So this is something I know when uh, we go and visit the Rotary in the fall, we will have MCAS numbers, especially for our fourth and fifth grade students. And we tend to look at growth, right? Because a lot of the kids we're talking about tend to struggle in math, so they might not score as high but their growth numbers are really high. So typical growth in math is between 40 to 60. We've generally been averaging numbers like 75, 85, 60. You know, we're high, normal high to high average. Um, we've never had low growth in any group that we've ever <coughs> run with. And I think we've gotten really good at it over the years. I think Jamie was talking a little bit about the pre-teaching. You know, the first few years was a lot of experimenting with different things to see what made the biggest difference. I think Jamie's right, like the pre-teaching was one of the biggest things because we noticed that kids weren't just engaged in the sessions after school, but were more engaged in class too. So we were getting a lot of bang for our buck by approaching it that way. So I think we've gotten really good at it. It's made a real difference. And I pretty consistently hear from kids or parents. Actually, today in my school council, at the end of the day, walking out, um, one of our parents who has triplets who's in the program was talking to me about what a difference the program made for her kids this year. So um, it, it's pretty, you know, it's not a huge, huge number of kids. I think we were about 85 kids this year that we worked with. Typically, it's We've been around 50 to 60 kids, so, but it's intensive, and for the kids that we are working with, it makes a real big difference, and I agree with Jamie. I appreciate, you know, the, I know the Rotary's funding was down a little bit because of COVID, um, and they were still able to give us a nice chunk of money, and the district being able to step up, recognizing it's an impactful program and funding the rest of it and allowing us to expand has been great, because it really does make a difference for a lot of kids. It, it excites me, the concept of bringing in the high school students as uh, tutors and, um, yeah. you know, in some respects, mentors, right? Yep. Um, and I think that's fantastic. And anytime we can involve sort of the opportunity for kids to see beyond what's in grade school and beyond what's in middle school and what comes up to high school, I think is a fantastic opportunity. Yeah, I agree. That's Jamie's vision. It's something he's talked about for a long time, wanting to try to happen. It was nice to be able to hand the reins over and let him run with it. He's done a great job this year, so. Brian. Mr. Chair, I'd just like to recognize the fact that, that Derek and Matt Bruce sort of were the pioneers of this program and really worked together to start it, but it's really expanded to the point, and Derek mentioned the district kicking in. We were able to put $15,700 worth of ESSER II funding in it, uh, the program this year, to expand it, uh, to include a, all those students that Derek mentioned. We also have ESSER III money uh, on deck for future years. Uh, for the next couple of years anyways, and that is to the tune of, I believe, $20,000. So, so we will continue this program, and it will continue, uh, and we thank the Rotary uh, for their generous contributions to this program and for starting this program uh, and extending the school day because it works and it has worked and it will work in the future. So thank you all very much. Well, and I, I would like to introduce, I absolutely don't know if I have every Rotary m member's name down here, but... I know they were going to come down with a check. I don't know if we should be going down there or over here, but um, if, if uh, Kevin Schmidt and Matt Bruce, Will, Willie DeFilly, Sue Okalita, and uh, Linda Corey um, could all come down, yeah. Do, do you, one of you guys want to speak about the rotary for a minute? Because I have a couple of rotary questions, if that's okay. All right, so I guess uh, you want me to start with a Rotary intro or do you want to start right away with questions? I'm no, fine either way. Why don't you talk a little about the Rotary first? All right, well, first thing is Rotary International is a huge organization that looks at all opportunities we can find to provide educational assistance, financial assistance for any situation. I should have prepared this a little better, but <laughs> it, it, all right. Current president, very poor public speaker, but <laughs> so we look at situations where people are in need and they are approached with a situation that's beyond their control to affect and anything that we can provide assistance to better that situation 
is we'll go to any means that we have the availability to go to for that. And I think Matt actually saw a great opportunity with that years back where you look at early life and you can see that little deflections of the trajectory you're moving in can make all the difference in the world of where you end up. And I love to see that we're starting earlier and earlier, getting down to second grade, because that puts us in a position where you can start making little trajectories go up instead of where they might have gone down from a poor result. And you start people up high, and the sky's the limit. And, and I guess my next question for you, are you looking for new volunteers and new members of the Rotor? Oh, every day. And, and if so, how can people join the Rotary in Middleborough? You could start by coming to a Wednesday night meeting. If you'd like to, we meet at the fireside at 615 every Wednesday. And also you could email middlebarrotary.com if you have any questions for us. We're uh, Middle Bar Rotary on Facebook, and you can reach out to any of us that any way. You can email me at kschmidt, S-C-H-M-I-D-T as in Delta Tango, rotary, at gmail.com, and I'd be glad to field any questions. And one more question, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm remembering from past Rotary experiences. Um, you don't have to be a Middleborough resident, but for example, you could be a business owner in Middleborough and join the Rotary, correct? Correct. correct. You could work in Middleborough and... <laughs> correct. And actually, the rules have changed quite a bit over time, and they've grown a lot more lenient with that type of thing where type of rules and regulations on who can and can't be a member pretty much it's if you want to help better your community or help out internationally come find us we'll show you the way um, and my last question for you is I know about the uh, obviously the rotary raise and I'm familiar with the rotary scholarship to kids can you talk a little about the other things that you do in the community how long you got <laughs> I want to give you an opportunity to explain so because I think what happens a lot of times is people people are afraid to join but when they find out what they do in their community then they're like hey my child got that you know got that rotary scholarship this is my chance to give back I have a little bit of time or hey I knew somebody who got that service because of them so I, I want to make sure you can talk about that great so I won't go too long in the international. Right now we got some help in Haiti and some help in Ukraine going on, and we can answer more questions on that. But if we're focusing on local, one thing that we do that's been booming in the last couple of years is book boxes, where we put up these little mini libraries. We actually just put one up yesterday at the Field of Dreams. We have one at Pierce Park, uh, three other ones in town as well. And we take donations of books and we get rid of all old books and we steward the boxes and just fill them and then kids can come by and grab any book they'd like free of charge and that seems to be getting more popular. We also support School on Wheels, Massachusetts, where we donate school supplies, backpacks, and then we go in and we help actually stuff the backpacks that get donated to School on Wheels. And for anybody who's not familiar with School on Wheels, that is a support for homeless kids and it provides them with the school supplies that they may not have access to and additionally it supplies tutors and mentors where one of our current members and a past president Kevin Quackenbush is actually deeply involved with that program and let's see we've helped out at the Soul Farm area where we actually came in and donated some material and helped work on the early childhood education center there where you know you can take the kids there and you play in the what do they call it, the mud area I believe or the mud garden it's something like that all right <laughs> mud kitchen there we go that's close <laughs> and that's helped out with that uh, after we went to the ooh, cranberry bread that's a good one too um every Soul year farm. we as members, we buy the material to bake cranberry breads, and depending on the demand of a given year, ranging, let's say, three to 400 loaves of cranberry bread, we give to the local food pantry on that for a holiday donation on that. At uh, Camp Umicus, 
We helped out last year with picking up after those microburst storms. I don't know if y'all remember when that happened, but they just made a huge mess everywhere. So we've helped out with cleaning up that and actually for polio plus every year for still working on eradication of polio. It's odd to think of that now. It's actually an original purpose of the Rotary Club circa 1919, I believe. Don't quote me on the year, but close enough when they were founded, they were working on eradicating polio, which was a lot more rampant than it is today. And we do a spinathon. It's a fun little fundraiser and we gain a little money and then we put that into Rotary International for eradication of polio. And recently the Gates Foundation has actually doubled whatever the Rotary Foundation puts in on that. So that's been an interesting one. I'm probably forgetting at least three or four. Anybody got a good one? I did. Got bug boxes. Anything you want else? to talk about the your your primary fundraiser, the auction? Isn't that your primary fundraiser a little bit every year? It is. That's changing a bit as viewing is down. So we've actually transformed that into a internet auction where we do it via biddingowl.com, and we actually take everything through online. We do still videotape it and we post it, but now it's all digital auction as opposed, it's more like going on eBay than doing live bidding on that. And I was also reminded of one that I can't believe I forgot to bring up because it's one of my personal favorites. If you've noticed recently, the Middleborough Skate Park is in a woeful state of disrepair and there have been some problems there. There's uh, myself and four other Middleborough High School graduates have taken on putting a committee together and we're working on tearing down and rebuilding the skate park with a newer, safer, and better for skill progression skate park in that area. And the Middleborough Rotary Club has actually partnered with the Middleborough Skate Park Committee. And I'm excited to see where that goes. We actually have a event coming up on July 16th. We'll be doing a fundraiser on that, so keep your ears peeled for that one. Anything else? Okay. That's all I got for that. That's a lot. So thank Thanks. you very much for the Rotary and all you guys do. And one more thing I should have mentioned. Any new members, bring on new projects. That's what we want. Does anyone have any questions for the Rotary? Rich. Uh, thank you so much for everything you guys do for this program. I think I, I liked what you said in the very beginning about the little nudges to the trajectory and thinking about how long that line is for kids this young, those little nudges can make it just a massive difference uh, over the course of their lives, I think. Um, my question, even though I love the idea, of course, of having high school students come down, I just wondered if, if there was a gap and you were looking for volunteers, um, how, how can people find out about opportunities to help do some of this, uh, this mentoring? I'm going to deflect that one to Derek. I'd say at the start of the year, just, you know, reach out to Mr. O'Brien. You can reach out to myself. I know Mrs. White, too. Um, if someone was interested, we're always, you know, definitely we have the capacity, I think, and the ability now to bring in volunteers, and we know what to do with them now. We, we didn't before, so we have a system for that now. Great. But you have to like math. <laughs> or reading. I think we got some some future up here. Yeah. <laughs> Marcy, go right ahead. I don't have a question, but I just want to say thank you for your continued investment in the Middleborough students. Uh, Rotary Rays has a soft spot in my heart. My oldest, who's now a freshman here, um, attended the ELA um, Rotary Rays at his time at MKG, and he is he excels as a student now, and he wouldn't if he didn't have the teachers identify him and he didn't have the support of Rotary Rays to help bridge the gap for his um, uh, ELA. So thank you. Good to hear. You're very welcome. <laughs> so if you want to come up and we can take a picture with the check, unless you have something else, so go right ahead. I was going to add one more thing. That Absolutely. If people want to help, if people want to make a donation to the 
rotary rates and they want it to be uh, tax deductible, they can do it through the Rotary Club. We are a 501c3, and if you write it to us with the intention, we can put that in our yearly donation and add to that where it definitely I would talk to Mr. O'Brien on that for educational assistance where we don't touch that personally, but for anything that you want to do financial, we can put that as a tax deductible donation. Good. So why don't you come on up and we'll do the picture up here. <coughs> oh, you really want that check. No, no <laughs> I just, you know, just so everyone knows, the reason I like big checks <laughs> is, is not what's written on them for money, but I want the people who, who donate their time, their energy, and sometimes their money to have an opportunity to come up and people to see that. Because I think time and time again, there are lots of groups in the community that need help and volunteers, and this is a way to showcase them so people oh, come. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, Next item on our agenda, which I'm a little behind on, but I'm not early, so that makes it okay, is um, school choice and the hearing on school choice. So I'll turn that over to you, Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, members of the audience. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of school choice a little bit, and then uh, explain why we're having a hearing tonight. Um, basically, in, in Massachusetts, there's a presumption that all school committees will participate in school choice. Um, under the school choice law, Mass General Law, Chapter 76, Section 12B, as amended in 1993 by the Ed Reform Act, all school districts in Massachusetts are presumed to participate in and admit non-resident students through school choice. A receiving district can withdraw from school choice only if a school committee holds a public hearing on this issue and then votes to withdraw from the school choice program prior to June 1st. The hearing and the school committee's vote can occur at the same meeting and may occur at a scheduled school committee meeting provided there is notice to the public, and there was, we published in the Brockton Enterprise, that this item will be discussed and that the members of the public are afforded an opportunity to participate and make their positions known to the school committee prior to the vote. 
Uh, a separate meeting is not required for this purpose. A school committee that intends to continue participating in school choice is not required to hold a hearing or to vote. Uh, but because we're talking about the possibility of not having school choice anymore, that's the reason we're having a public hearing tonight. A timely decision and vote by the school committee to withdraw from school choice is effective only for the following school year. So this vote tonight, if we make it, is only good for one year. While the Department of Ed and Secondary Ed does not review decisions to withdraw from school choice, the school committee must notify the department of its vote by June 1st to withdraw and the reasons for the withdrawal as soon as reasonably possible after the vote. A school committee withdrawing from school choice must continue to serve all non-resident students previously admitted through school choice. Uh, our school committee policy is policy JFBB on school choice and it basically reads it is the policy of this school district to admit non-resident students under the terms and conditions of the inter-district school choice law. This decision must be reaffirmed annually prior to June 1st by a vote of the school committee following a public or hearing. In the event the Middleborough School Committee votes to participate, the following local conditions would apply and there are a number of conditions that apply. One of these speaks to Meg Janessa's uh, Member Meg Janessa's question last week about the fact of younger siblings. Um, if we say no to school choice, we say no to lo younger siblings at this point. Um, there are no exceptions. There is a piece in our school committee policies that says exception to this policy may be, may be made by the superintendent of schools with the approval of the school committee. Um, that, as I understand, is underneath the piece that says in the event the Middleborough School Committee votes to participate, the following local conditions. So I could change things if we participated, but can't change things if we don't. That's basically simple. That's the simple point as I understand it. Questions that came out last week with regard to school choice. We have currently have 42 students who are in the district under school choice. We will be losing one. We have one grade 12 student. So we will continue to have 41 school choice students. Uh, we do fund a number of teaching positions with the funds that come in from school choice. Um, and that's what we're looking to do in the future, perhaps by, by your vote. We do have students that go out, our, our current number is approximately 58 students that go out of district. We have an, also have a number of students who are in different uh, tech academies. Last year, we're trying to get the, the latest numbers on that. I've been working with Katie Goodine, who's our student information management system person in the district, trying to get an a eye on or a handle on exactly how many of those students are still in these uh, internet uh, academies, basically. They're online learning. So that's where we stand. Uh, the next number was as we transition to school, uh, what, we, what are we looking at for district enrollment? And our district enrollment will stay about the same at the elementary schools. Uh, we, the kindergarten is always unpredictable every year. Uh, we're always looking at possibly potentially adding a, teach, adding a teacher. We are not usually in a position where we're looking to, to deduct a teacher at the kindergarten level. Uh, at the high school level, uh, we have 203 students who are graduating. And right now, currently, we have 221 out of the 259 eighth graders who are scheduled to go to the high school, which basically, if you look at the numbers, is a net gain of about 12 students at the high school. Uh, that number, if you look at it, is a basic 880 students in this high school uh, for next year. Re keeping in mind that the design enrollment for this high school was 710 students with a flexibility of approximately 15%. So. Um, we are definitely, I'm not going to say we're overcrowded, we're bursting at the seams, the high school. Uh, the, the staff and faculty have been able to handle the numbers, we're able to do it. That, that design enrollment is based on the number of home rooms in the school uh, and the number, <coughs> the number of classes. So when those students go to classes, they go, three classes go to the gym. One goes to the band room, one goes to the black box theater, and they spread out amongst the school. So they do definitely spread out. Um, uh, but. It is a high number and we certainly need to be, keep that in mind as we look at entertaining the, the thought of school choice for next year. Uh, other, other questions were about average class size and I will give you those numbers for, for next year. Uh, starting with the uh, Early Childhood Center, again, we really don't know. We're looking at probably a class of 230 students. That's our best guesstimate at this point based on trends from the past and registrations we have currently. Um, for the Henry B. Birkeland School, we're looking at first grade. Uh, I'm gonna, it's, it's digital, so it's 18.7 students per class in first grade. At grade two, 22 average. At grade three, 20.2 average. At grade four, 21.8 average. 
and grade five 19.3. That's based on predictions for next year, based on the enrollment we have currently. At the MKG, we have 20.1 at first grade, 20.8 at second grade, 20.5 at third grade, 19.3 at fourth grade if we add an additional fourth grade teacher, which we may need to do, because if we don't, the number is higher and more significant. In grade five, it's 21. So that is the, those are the elementary numbers. At the middle school, in my conversations with Mrs. Latenda, they are definitely looking at the seventh grade because the class average sizes are a little bit higher. Uh, our class average size at sixth grade for next year is predicted to be 19.75. At seventh grade, 27.87. At eighth grade, 19.6. And we are looking to add a team through some resignations and some changes at the school uh, to perhaps add an additional team at the seventh grade level to reduce those class sizes. Uh, because of our additional enrollment this year, our foundation budget went up significantly. Uh, we just received an additional amount of money from the state for school districts that were significantly affected by enrollment, whether they lost students or gained students, and where we gained 92 students on record from last year to this year, uh, we did receive additional monies. So we can fund additional positions based on those monies if we need to. And those folks that were on the budget subcommittee know how tight the money was, but we did receive some additional money. So uh, if that's meant to reduce class size, that, that we could do that, and that would be, further down the road discussions that we need to have, uh, and certainly that'll be brought to the board as we introduce those positions, if those positions are needed. So that's sort of where we stand with regard to class size, where we stand with regard to our numbers. Could we add some students at the elementary level and not really notice it, spread them out over four or five grades, and get some additional students in here, but eventually those students end up at the high school. And that's, that's our issue that we're looking at. And I've talked about this before, but just to let you know, uh, that as a committee, as a building committee, we went to the state. We appealed their decision. They had 10 growth models that say, this is what we're going to do. Their design enrollment for us to start the year, they gave us 684. We, they thought at this, when we opened up the building, we'd be at 684. Um, we explained all the building that's going on in the town. Uh, we explained all the buildable lots that are in the 70, 70 square mile town. And um, it didn't fall on deaf ears. They, they, improved, they increased it from 684 to 710, um, but that's a classroom, basically. So, uh, and that's not a wing, if you will. Uh, and so that's, that's, they say you can, you need, you need to, when you put your building in a place by design, you need to provide an area where you can expand if need be. So we, we just built a $100 million building. Uh, we shouldn't really be talking about expanding it. But it's happened in other communities. I know it happened in Berkeley, Somerset. They had, a, they had a design enrollment for 800 and change, I think, and they opened up the building with over 1,000 students. So um, they're, designed, they're, they're basically their design enrollment uh, formulas probably maybe need to look at. Don't quote me on that, but uh, I just think that... At, yeah, that's true. <laughs> But as we move forward, uh, there was certainly a reason back in the day when, when after 93 that Middleborough did not adopt school choice. We had some flexibility a few years back when I came in. Um, there was definitely a need to bring some additional monies into town. There was an opportunity to bring some additional monies into town. It has come in handy over the years. Uh, it funds, I believe, four positions. Yes. Four positions, four teaching positions are completely funded with our annual school choice money. Um, and they will continue to be as long as we have those students in there at about the 40 rate. Uh, next year, depending on the 11th graders that leave, uh, that become 12th graders next year and, and leave, we may need to look at it again for the lower grades, looking at those class size numbers as they move forward. Because when you have an eighth grade that's 259 students like we do, it's probably the larger group, the largest group that we have going through. Um, it's the, the snake through the pig, if you will. And it's that group of 259 students that we depend on those students to go to BP. We depend on those, many of those students. The lowers go, the students going to BP right now are 31. We expected at least 45. It may end up being 45, but we don't know. If it ends up being 45, then that just lessens the number at the high school uh, that, we, that we're experiencing right now or that we anticipate. So that's sort of the summary of where we are enrollment-wise, where we are data-wise. Um, and looking at next year, uh, my recommendation to the school committee uh, is that we not adopt school choice for next year, that we vote school choice down for a year, 
uh, to give it a rest. We're in effect losing one student for this next year uh, and really look at reassessing as we look forward to classes that are coming in at 230, 220, 230, 230, 220, and those kids coming up to the high school, if 30 or 40 kids go to BP, especially with a new BP being built, those classes may come into the high school at about 180, 185, 190. And perhaps some of those predictions for lower enrollment will come, come into uh, play, so. I would also add two things. One being that this building has done what we exactly hoped it would do, which is retain students um, in the middle school coming to the high school. Um, the second piece that I think is an additional problem, um, and then we did bring it up with the MSBA, is uh, we have a town that has a considerable amount of buildable lots, and I mean, we probably have one of the busier zoning and uh, planning boards in, you know, in the county because of the amount of work that's going on. You can see the work happening right now. The old Rockland Trust building is being converted into apartments. There's, we just voted, not this year, but the previous year for smart growth around the, what will be the new train station and the ability to build buildable lots there, build apartments there. It is, a, you know, a pretty constant flow that Middleborough has um, new buildings and we constantly, we don't see a lot with, at times, but we are picking up kids here and there. And through you, Mr. Chair, we have had to uh, provide a lot of data to the planning board because they are very concerned about the, the apartment buildings that are potentially going up in the community and what they'll zone for and what they can do. Um, we've been impacted by apartments in the past. Uh, if a two bedroom or three bedroom apartment is built, it's generally not a single couple buying that or renting that. So um, we need to look to that. I, I last checked, I think last week, I know last week I talked to Bob Whalen, he said there are 59 single family houses being built in the town currently. Um, and then you look at apartments like the, the bank place uptown at, at uh, John Glass Square slash Everett Square. Uh, that is going to be, I believe, 20 apartments. Uh, I think it was originally scheduled for 16. Somebody in the audience know more? 18, thank you. So those will be 18 apartments. Um, and, uh, and we continue to build, so. And as the superintendent said, you have one stu school choice student leaving. So this is a good time to have the pause and reassess. Um, it's not to say that we won't open up again. It's just to say we, uh, you know, I feel as I know the superintendent does, we really need to take some time and reevaluate and see how we do. It, you know, it is a, a sad reality for some families that kids may be split up or that they don't have the opportunity and um, we feel badly for that. Um, but we, again, as the superintendent said, nothing changes for the students who are currently in school on school choice that they, they remain until they wish to leave or 12th grade questions marcy go ahead so if we participate in school choice we're able to pick and choose what schools we allow open to school choice that's that's true marcy we could say um we want to open it up just for kindergarten alone okay we could say we want to open up for third and fourth grade we can't do specific schools but we can do grades okay so that leads me back to, I know a bunch of us here have concerns about siblings. I know that was a thing. So I did some looking, checking on our actual policies and the policy that you mentioned, the JFBB school choice policy, line five, it says applicants with siblings currently attending the Middleborough Public Schools will be placed prior to an enrollment lottery. So well, if we chose to open up the MECC to allow maybe some of the siblings to come in, we could place those above doing a lottery according to our policy. It, it, if you look above that in the final line of the paragraph at the top, it says in the event the Middleborough School Committee votes to participate, the following local conditions would apply. Right. So we would have to vote to participate in the policy. And then it says later that what you just, uh, applicants with siblings currently attending the Middleborough Public Schools will be placed prior to an enrollment lottery. Right. So we would have to open up school choice in the district. Right. But we'd have to open it up. Right, but we, could we pick one school, just say the kindergarten and that was it, to allow for siblings? We, we could do that, the school committee could choose to do that. Just, yes. That was my question, okay. Yeah. But we would have to we would have to accept school choice. 
right. and, and accept the specific grade? No, understood. Correct. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Yep. Go ahead, Rich. Um, I think maybe more of a question for Brian, but um, I, I believe I found uh, out on the internet, but, but actually on the Mass General Law um, site, that um, the tuition that the receiving district gets is something like Eight, eighty, five hundred, something like that. All depends on the child. Okay. Um, it, uh, basically, the, the basic uh, income is approximately five thousand dollars per student. I see. And then, if a child has uh, is has is more involved educationally, then the the price goes up. I see. And the the question I'm getting at with that is that um, uh, I believe I believe I understand the answer to this, and it's all I think it's all about fixed costs that aren't variable by student. But I know in the budget presentation that we had in February that Ms. Hickey gave, um, we saw that we spend about fifteen thousand per student. A little bit so, more than that. So I think I understand that the reason why those are very different, those two numbers, is that there's certain costs that we're not exactly spending on a you know per child basis. It's correct. like the building. That's correct. So is is that so? We are actually netting a gain. From having school choice students in, is it? Yeah, we we do get money into the budget. Yeah. Um, but and the pay. money that goes out uh, is subtracted from the town. Doesn't not come out of our operational budget. So got it. The, the thing to think about, Rich, is this, and this is the way we've always viewed it. If you have, um, I'm going to use Marcy's conversation about the kindergarten. The kindergarten is set currently at a number. Okay. If we opened up X amount of slots that would require another teacher, then you'd have to make sure that you're getting that amount in, mm. in, in thing. But for example, adding one or two slots just adds to classrooms. It doesn't, it doesn't change the cost. The cost will remain the same yep. uh, for everything else going on. It's th the number of those, those additional students won't be essentially adding more cost. Those students that have significant costs, um, the state reimburses for example, at special ed at 100%. So whatever a student costs for their uh, special ed uh, issues are reimbursed at 100%. Mr. Chair, it's not 100%, but it's a, it's a formula. It depends also on what the placement is. If, if it's an outside right. placement, yeah. Right, yeah. that's all. I'll go right uh, in. I have two questions. Um, how many classrooms do we have at MEC? Currently have, Mr. Jeremy, we're here. I believe we have 12. 11. 11, 11 regular classrooms and, and a, a special needs classroom, correct, Ms. Latenda? I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I know you just left there a couple years ago. <laughs> yeah, currently. And Correct. Okay, thank you. And then do we have um, a number of students in the district that would have an, a sibling coming into kindergarten? Like are there 10 families I, in that case? Are there three? We, we don't really know we that. Don't know. Okay. No. But if you, to, to basically our starting pay for a bachelor one teacher is over $50,000. So really if you're talking about accepting students and having a, a sort of a even balance here it would be about 10 students that would have to come in to the district gotcha. to fund that additional teacher and there are communities that have have made that gamble uh, my brother was the superintendent of berkeley public schools um, and they were looking to open up school choice and sort of were hoping that the surrounding communities would like to send their kids to berkeley and they were fortunate and they were able to take that gamble and they were able to, to get those 10 or 11 students that, that first year and then it became a popular thing. So, but it, it is a gamble in some instances. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Uh, I just wanna make sure, I, and you did say, I just wanna confirm with you, because we have the 41 students that are staying, if we opt out of the school choice. Yeah the funding that we still we still receive the funding for those we do so we won't lose the positions that are being funded by by those students we do the law has what's called a stay put clause okay. which means that the kids who are here stay here unless there's some form of an emergency all right students i should say mr chair Yes. Um, not a question necessarily, but um, just kind of thinking out loud um, where we don't necessarily 
know what the future holds for building and we all uh, I think a bunch of us were probably at town meeting and heard about some of these upcoming developments that could be potentially massive and since when we bring a student in under school choice that student is here for as long as they'd like to be all the way up to the high school where we have this big kind of population um, problem with the high school right now it feels like right now in my opinion anyways it would be difficult for me to consider bringing in new new kids at the lower levels knowing that we could potentially have them for the rest of their time at the school and we don't even know what's going to happen um, with with building and with the capacity of this school right here um, just some thoughts That's so uh, two other things that i think are important too as everyone knows uh, the united states went through a census recently so looking at the census number and the changes since the last census, um, Middleborough persons under the age of five years increased by 4.8%, and persons under the age of 18 years increased by 18.3% wow. over that period in time. Um, so obviously there's a significant trend in rising numbers um, and we're retaining students. Um, so that's where it becomes difficult, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. Also, Mr. Chair, um, with re regards to the town population, uh, I believe uh, spoke to Bob Noons a little bit over the last summer about town population census. And it looks like since the last census, our town grew about 12.5% in population from approximately 24,000 up to about 27,000. And we, as, as uh, Mr. Lynch mentioned, the buildable lots, are, there's still plenty. And uh, these, these large developments that are potentially coming our way uh, aren't here yet. So um, it makes me nervous is all. And, um, but I'd be, I'd be interested to hear what the rest of the committee thought about that. There are a number of developments that are on the architect's table right now, the designer's table. Yep. Any other questions? I just have one. Marcy. I don't even know if we would know the answer to this, but do we have any um, information from the teachers at kindergarten about how they feel what the current class sizes that they have? Like, do they feel that they're at capacity? Do they feel they could take on one more student? I, or, Ms. Frigo, I, I can't answer for them, but I would tell you that, that the research out there shows the lower class sizes at the lower levels, the better. Uh, and I think that as long as if we can keep the number as low as possible uh, we're, we're better off and those students are better off we're fortunate to have a situation which allows us to have a full-time teacher and a full-time assistant in every classroom uh, which is not commonplace I would tell you that having been a principal over in Bridgewater for a number of years um, we had teachers who had 26 27 28 students in their classes with no ESP help no extra no extra support in those classrooms so we're fortunate uh, but I think it, it it's good for the students uh, and I think it's good for the teachers and if you ask the teachers if they would prefer a lower class size I think they're gonna say yes um, I would also answer Marcy this way that class size has been a topic of discussion yeah. in negotiations okay. what is the current class size at Mac, it looks like uh, around I 20. I think you sent that to we're us. We're right around 20. Yeah. Okay. Right around 21. Any other conversation? Um, seeing as it's the superintendent's recommendation. Oh, anyone in the audience have any questions? Excuse me. Thank you. Seeing it was the superintendent's recommendation to uh, not participate in school choice for this year. Um, we'll start with the chill and entertain a motion not to participate in school choice this year. So moved. Do I hear a second? Second. Discussion. Good. Sorry. Thank I you. just, if we have 21 kids in class sizes now, if we're looking at approximately 230 kids coming in and there's 11 classes, that puts us at the exact same numbers. Yes. So increasing two or three of a sibling, I, I don't see that as a that you're gonna have three classes with 22 kids instead of 21. I don't see that as a huge increase at that level, at just MEC. I'm not talking about any other school, but just kindergarten. So you're saying keep it open for kindergarten? For just you're, kindergarten. You're hoping to keep it open for kindergarten. Yeah. My, my only comment to that would be that we just don't know what that number is gonna look like. Between all these people moving into town with summer registrations, there's really no predicting until the first day of school, and even on the first day of school, Mm. parents show up 
with, with registration forms and, and they're ready to go. So kindergarten can be really unpredictable. That's, that would be my, my comment to you. And so uh, I just want to step back for one thing because uh, it was something that Marcy said and I want to uh, qualify this. You would have to set a number for kindergarten, right? Okay. So let's, let's say we set the number at five mm -hmm. for, for purpose of discussion. If it's six siblings that put in for it, it becomes a lottery at that point too. So that's the only thing I want, you know, I just wanted to make sure the, you know, the potential still exists that you can have people out on the out and not participate, that's all. Right. Rich. And Mr. Chair, just one thing, um, it just hit me when we were just talking about what the incoming class could be, um, um, to Meg's point, um, that I believe, if I heard Mr. Lynch right, that there, the 59 single family homes are not yet built and they, they are being They're built. Currently as we being speak, built, yes. And the 20 apartments at John Glass Square aren't yet operational, They're but will not. be soon. They're under construction. So I know we don't know what's going to happen in those places, but um, it represents an X factor that we can't really plan for. Um, and right now, I'm just, I'm really just thinking so every single spot that we open for school choice right now, given that the inevitable of the population issues that we have here and even some in the middle school, it just seems like we're stealing from a, a Middleborough resident to give to someone else in, in the future. Well, That's I, what it kind of feels like. I do want to caution it this way. And um, while I appreciate what you said, um, Middleborough residents are, are benefiting from school choice because we're putting money in positions that we weren't able to fund prior. Correct. So okay. for example, that's good. Um, and Mr. Brannigan, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I know for a fact we hired a biology teacher to help with biology MCAS um, to help with students that were having problems and it gave, it gave more one less numbers in biology classes so when students hit MCAS it was there. Mm -hmm. um, we have used uh, some of the money for example to buy um, Chromebooks and computers up here. Um, we have used it in other places too, but I, I don't want people to think in any way, shape, or form that because we have choice, the community hasn't benefited from it. It has uh, time and time again. So I do want to say that. That's important. Yeah, thank one you. One more question. No, go right ahead. Right. Um, say we have 10 families in the district that have siblings that would be coming into kindergarten and we choose to not participate in school choice. Um, potentially those families could choose to not send their children here, which would then we would lose funding for. So then that would be a teacher position. So then we're looking at. Could, could, could you ask that question again? I, I don't understand. Say we have chil children already participating in school choice. Okay. Of various grades. Who have siblings. Who have siblings that will be entering kindergarten and they're waiting to hear if they will be accepted. And we choose not to participate uh, as a parent I may choose to pull my child yep. so my kids can all just, I mean, yep. just the ease for on Understood. logistics. Um, so what, I mean, could that possibly be a factor and say we lose funding and then there goes a position to pay for a teacher? We, we would definitely lose some of the funding if we're down, if, if, if we're at 41 and we're counting on that 41 and then all of a sudden three students leave would be $15,000 less. Um, but that that's that would be the case but it wouldn't affect us this year Mars for next school year for the c coming school year it would not affect us because that money's already um, guaranteed. guaranteed guaranteed okay that money's based on our October 1st enrollment okay. mm -hmm. from last year now there is a question in the comments um, says are we going to take away spots for students who are already here now in case we have more later um, and to my knowledge, that no, that's not. that's the stay put clause. Yeah, that's the stay put. Unless there's a lack of funding, that would be the only way we could eliminate students out of the district, which we would not do because we don't we're not currently ex experiencing a lack of funding. All right. Thank you. I just wanted to have that yep. cleared up for. Yep. And somebody asked what the spending per student is. It's about fifteen thousand. Sarah. Seven. Seven, sorry. I can pull that up if you can get sure. it. Sure. Um, Mr. Chair, yeah. I just looked at it. Cause, oh. uh, uh, it's um, it's right over 15.1 thousand per student, and the state average is right over 17. Um, that was from your February um, numbers. But I believe that was the FY19. Well, it, yeah. the, the numbers that the state has have to go with the audited end of year reports. So mm -hmm. my FY21 end of year report was submitted in the fall and audited over the winter and the data for FY21 will be available next year. 
So that's FY20 data that you're looking at. Okay, got it. Mrs. Latender, go right ahead. Kindergarten. Typically and ideally, you would want 15 to 18 students per kindergarten class, so even 2022 is pretty high for kindergarten. I just wanted to uh, clarify mm -hmm. that um, just to experience it. <laughs> um, but ideally, like research, at the early childhood level, you really want lower numbers, like Mr. Lynch had mentioned, 15 to 18. So 22 is high, it's manageable, but obviously it's, it's better to have less kindergartners who don't know how to follow directions and such because um, they're adorable and just need a lot of direction and <laughs> redirection uh, until they learn the routines but uh, um, Meg knows that so somebody, <laughs> put, somebody put in the chat and true. I want to clarify this my question was misunderstood I meant taking away spots for kids who are waiting to go in this year for those who may come in a few years and I, I want to explain that that's not happening we would essentially lose one spot for a, um, for a high school student who is leaving this year for the 12th grade. We are having more eighth graders come to school next year than we have in the past. Right. So it's the biggest class we've ever had. So we are not, th th these are kids who are here currently. Mm. Um, so that we lose one spot in the high school and all the other kids come. Uh, the more kids come, which is fantastic. So that's the piece I want to make sure. Mr. Oakley, go ahead. Mr. Chair, I was just thinking for, for myself, what would, what would one year do for me? And I think I'm guessing that by next year, we'll have a much better idea of what's going to happen with the, the 40R uh, developments that were talked about at town meeting. And we'll probably also have a much better idea of what, if anything, we can do to handle some of that increased load in the high school. And so, because uh, I, I don't just want to arbitrarily say no just because, but it seems like by this time next year, we'll have a much better idea of what this town's going to look like numbers wise. Um, and, if, yeah. yeah and, and to that point, Mr. Oakley, through you, Mr. Chair, yeah. uh, we increased over 90 students for this year mm. based on kids moving into town. So yeah. we jumped up 90 students, which is fairly significant, which is why the state noticed it which is why our foundation budget went up, which is why we got additional monies from the state because of that jump in the enrollment. So, you know, it's definitely been significant in, in terms of the state and, and their accounting and when, what they noticed. So, because there aren't many towns that are, that are their enrollments going up mm -hmm. by that percentage. Sarah, go ahead. I, I just want to clarify that when Superintendent Lynch is saying enrollment went up, on October 1st, we had a certain number of students and it, we went up over 90 students moving in since October 1st. Ah, okay. Any further discussion? I have a motion on the table to uh, not participate in school choice this year. Next oh, year. next year, at, excuse me, at sorry. All, at, in any grade. What? At all in any that, grade. That was the motion on the table. All, right. all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Nay. It's three to two. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to skip back in our agenda because we've uh, we had to skip around for the hearing. Next item on our agenda is public comment. Does anyone in the public wish to comment on anything not on tonight's agenda? And seeing no one, I will move on. Reports from school committee members. Mr. Oakley. Sure. Um, uh, just a short one, uh, Chair Young. Um, I I got I get the emails from Desi um, to my school committee email, and and most of them are targeted specifically to teachers. Actually, they probably all are. I probably wasn't even supposed to go to this, but um, there was a professional development opportunity about um, absenteeism, and I think it's particularly relevant for this. Um, I promise I'll get back there, but I think it's particularly relevant for um, the conversation that we had with the Rotary Rays about. Um, closing gaps and how much of a difference that can make in the future. And I just wanted to report just one quote from that, that professional development opportunity. And that was that um, for the, uh, the uh, absent days in the early grades can have a significant impact on reading level in middle school. And that impact on reading level in middle school can dramatically increase the dropout rates in high school. And so I think um, just if they needed further reason to know that the things that they are doing are important, the, where they come into the reading level and the math 
um, portion, I think, actually does has a have a really significant impact on potential dropouts in the future. Um, and so I just wanted to report back on that. It was a really, really interesting thing. But um, as Miss um, Lyons has said to me in the past at, at other meetings, the, the uh, acronyms in those trainings are just totally incredible. And so um, my head was spinning. Um, but that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Anybody, any other committee member have anything? Then with that, for the last time, I will turn it over to Natalia, oh. who I hope is wearing a Yukon shirt for yep. a reason. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you guys were going to ask. <laughs> yes, I'm going to Yukon. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you. So I'll turn it over to you, Natalia. OK, thank you. First, I want to introduce Nate. This is Nate Donahue. He will be taking over for me next year. He'll be a senior next year. Hey, Nate. So I'm excited for him to take <laughs> over. But for my update, starting with the MEC, the MEC had a great visit from Big Ryan, who came to entertain the students and staff with stories. The MEC has also hosted a literacy night where the teachers presented strategies to promote reading and writing skills to families. They have also visited the Middleborough Fire Station, Library, and Pierce Playground and have more fun events planned for the final several weeks of school. Next, for MKG. Next week, the MKG will be finishing up their MCAS testing with the grade five science test on Tuesday, May 24th, and Wednesday, May 25th. A reminder for all that there is an early release day on May 27th, and dismissal at MKG is at 1 p.m. For, and for upcoming events, all grade five students will be visiting the State House in Boston. The Middleborough Fire Department will be presenting a summer safety program to all students in grades one through five, and lastly, Toe Jam Puppet Band will be performing to their grade one students. For HBB, the HBB is looking forward to wrapping up MCAS. The students will be done with math this week and next week grade five will participate in science MCAS when they move into, and then they move into a very busy fun stretch at HBB. All grades will be going on field trips in the coming weeks. Grade one is going to Seoul Homestead Grade two is going to Roger Williams Park Zoo. Grade three is going to Plymouth Plantation. Grade four is going to Round the Bend Farm and grade five is going to Franklin Park Zoo. They are also looking forward to the grade three musical, the art show, the band and orchestra performance and field day. They also have Jay Mankita from Playful Engineering coming back to work with grades three and four on STEM related activities thanks to a grant they received from the Mass Cultural Council. Lastly, they would like to encourage all parents to pay close attention to the newsletters and the calendar because they have something going on almost every day from now until the end of the year. Then for Nichols Middle School, NMS is finishing up MCAS testing this week and continuing, to make, continuing with makeup testing next week. The Builders Club students, led by Mr. Redpath, have planned two dances one for sixth grade on Thursday, June 9th, and one for seventh grade that will be held on June 3rd. The eighth graders will have their end of the year dance on Thursday, June 16th. Field trips are being organized for each grade, which students are very excited about as this has not happened in a few years. Lastly, the NMS play is this Friday, May 20th at 7 p.m. and Saturday, May 21st at 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. They will be charging $5 for normal entry and $3 for students and senior citizens. Lastly, for MHS, the junior prom was successfully held at the Middleborough Town Hall on Saturday, May 7th. Congrats to Isabella Kasimian and Zane Morrison for winning prom king and queen. We want to say congratulations to all of the following. All students who completed their AP exams the MHS band, orchestra, and choir for an amazing job with the spring concert, and all of the volunteers, fans in the stands, and unified athletes who were a part of the unified track and field championships. For all juniors, registration is now officially open for the annual college boot camp. There will be a boot camp during the week of August 8th and another one during the week of August 15th. Tomorrow, May 20th, is signing day for seniors. Pictures will be taken will be taken during block three. Everyone is encouraged to attend to show off your future plans. And a reminder for all seniors, 
If you have not paid them already, senior dues need to be collected from all members of the class of 2022. Dues are $50 and can be paid in cash or by bank check or money order. Checks are payable to the town of Middleborough. All dues can be paid by seeing Mrs. Holmgren in the main office. The following clubs will be taking place, will be taking place on Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Key Club in room C149, GSA in room C158, and Yes Club in room C159. And lastly, the members of the National Honor Society are offering a program to all students in all classes, allowing for weekly meetings with the one-on-one -on -one tutor. This is a free tutoring opportunity. Please reach out to Mr. Goldman if you are interested. For the last time, does anyone have any questions for Natalia? Mr. O. So, uh, as always, I, I really appreciate your updates. And I was just curious, what type of advice did you give to Nate uh, ahead of him joining our <laughs> committee? Um, well, I just gave him the rundown. I'm giving him my whole document, what to email the principals, where to look for information. Um, I just told him not to be nervous. There's nothing to be nervous about. <laughs> nothing, yeah. I told him there's not usually um, that many people here in the beginning. <laughs> but I, th I think he's ready. Awesome. And, and Mr. Chair, just an observation Please. that uh, given that Natalia's name is Natalia and <laughs> Nate's name is Nate, it feels like this wasn't exactly random. <laughs> so um, anyway, I'm happy to have you on and, and look forward to uh, working you. with you. I look forward to working with all you guys. Cool. Meg, get right ahead. I just wanted to say thank you to Natalia. You give such great updates thank and you. you always talk about every school and I love that. Thank you. And I just want to wish you good luck. Thanks. Mm. Yeah. Anybody else? So, oh, go ahead, Dr. Uh, I was only here for the last two years <laughs> for you, but sitting next to you, yes. and, and I was that first day when I was sitting next to you, I was so nervous. <laughs> All right, I was so nervous, I was like <gasps> hyperventilating a little bit. But having a conversation with you puts me, put me right in the perspective of why I was here to begin with, which was for you guys, the students. Hmm. So, thank you. And thank you no for problem. every day that you came here. Thank you. And you sat down with us. Thanks. And Mr. Chair, through you, right ahead. on behalf of all the kids and all the teachers, we thank you for your participation. Uh, this is something that's required by law, basically. Um, but it's nice to have a smile and face here and report in the news. And I know that the principals enjoyed interacting with you and getting ready for your report. So and I'm glad you're going to be a Husky. I, I was just down to stores the other day, and my daughter <laughs> got her master's there. So pretty cool. Great campus. Beautiful. Yes. Thank you. So Natalia, I want to thank you personally um, for all your contact with me and your ability to answer my questions and um, have conversations about what life at the high school is. I greatly appreciate it. And so on behalf of the committee, we'd all like to say thank you. Oh my you. gosh, <laughs> thank you. Yes, and Natalia, you get to keep your nameplate. Oh my God, I'm excited. <laughs> Slide it out. Put, put it on your dorm. Put it on your dorm room door. Yeah. Say, listen, I'm important. <laughs> thank you. So thank you very much, Natalia. We appreciate everything you've done, and especially, um, I will say this: you really reached out to the other schools to make sure they were included in the students' report, and I can't thank you enough for that. So thank you very much. No problem. What? Sure, absolutely. We'll go off front again. This is picture day. Picture, picture, picture day. Picture day. Picture day. <laughs> I wish you had told me. I'm going to dress better. Yeah, I wouldn't have worn a wrinkly shirt. Put some more shirt. makeup on. Okay. Sean, Superintendent's report. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, members of the audience. 
Uh, my first item is the COVID report, COVID-19 update. Uh, as of yesterday evening at 5 p.m., our numbers are up from 20 to 50. Um, significant jump with this new variant that's out there. Uh, the numbers are pretty steady throughout. Uh, District-wide personnel are two. Memorial Early Childhood Center was three. HBB five, MKG two, um, Nichols Middle School 28, um, Middleborough High School 10, so that's a total of, of 50. So a uh, little bit of pocket, a little bit of higher number at the Nichols, uh, not necessarily one class throughout the building. And uh, so they're commensurate with the town. In the town, there have been 20 positive cases under 18 for the month of May so far. Uh, those are PCR tests and 89 positive PCR tests uh, for 18 plus community. Our community positivity rate is up to 0.05%. A recent case interviews with patients uh, continue to report people having mild symptoms. So no significant uh, effects of the disease, but uh, it's, the virus is still there. So, and we are up to 50 and we'll watch it closely um, and analyze those numbers as we look forward and our coordinator of nursing continues to do that. We still have our CIC nursing programs in place. We still have our testing in place um, and that will continue. And if a student is sick, uh, please stay home. And uh, that, that we would appreciate that. So. Any questions? Rich, go ahead. I was just curious, is the, is the difference between the town uh, numbers and, and our numbers just because we're using the kind of at-home test um, and their town's using the PCR, is that correct. right? Okay, thank yes, you. Yes, correct. Any other questions? Seeing none. Thank you. Up next on my agenda, wait a minute, cross off rotary. <laughs> oh, director of special education. That's next. I'd like to introduce our PPS director, Carolyn Lyons, who's brought along a special guest with her. Um, and she can do the introductions. Welcome. So I, I do want to say at the very beginning, um, the appointment of a special ed director requires school committee approval. Mm. Um, and since it is a personnel matter, I will not be taking questions from the audience. Okay. So thank you. Okay. Well, hello. I'm going to hold this. This is odd to hold this, but I'm going to do this. Yeah, I'm going to do that. <laughs> that's, too, that's too much like being on a cruise ship. Don't, don't enjoy that. Um, okay. I wanted, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I wanted to walk you through some of the process. Um, if you remember, I had spoken during my interview process about the fact that I was going to be shifting, or I desired shifting the role of pupil personnel services and splitting the role. The first split was into a director of special education position. My thinking behind this decision was to give special ed a singular focus going forward. Um, and I won't go into the reasons again. You've probably heard quite enough from me for the moment. What I'm going to tell you is that um, we launched a, a search process. We had 10 applicants uh, that applied, and the screening committee selected four candidates to interview. And it was at that point that I assembled a hiring committee. The hiring committee included uh, representatives from the following groups, special education teacher, paraprofessionals, related service providers, administration, which included special ed administration, elementary administration, secondary administration, parents, and a representative from CPAC. That's the Special Education Parent Advisory Council. So we assembled this group and we held the interviews and um, I am here to tell you about the candidate that was unanimously selected through this process. Um, I'm here to introduce tonight Ms. Jennifer Healy who has been an employee of the Middleborough Public Schools since 2011. In fact, Jennifer Healy was a sachem herself, graduating with the class of 2005 um, in the old building. What I can tell you about Jen is that she has spent the last six years as a special education administrator. She spent the six years prior to that being a special education teacher, all of which were spent here in Middleborough. She also um, had, I think, under a year, but also had experience. Her very first experience was being a paraprofessional. So she's really experienced all facets of special education um, and, in my opinion, is a true specialist and a true expert um, in the field of special education. She holds a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, 
and a CAGS, which is a Certificate of Advanced Graduate Study, um, all in special education. As I told you, she was the true unanimous choice for the entire committee, and part of the reason that was the case was because <coughs> of the vision that she expressed and a desire to take special education and move us forward um, in a comprehensive manner, which is something she's been able to do through her work um, over the last several years in this district. She has provided um, several facets of what special ed does every day, up to and including you know, additional assistance on the tiered focus monitoring and coordinated program review process through you know, PPS. She has managed as classroom teacher MCAS alt portfolios. She's been a district trainer in physical restraint. She is one of two uh, co-teach trainers in, our, in the methodology that, you know, the program is called RISE, but really the co-teach model, which is the primary model for inclusive programming for special education students. She helped in the development of the AIMS program. Um, in fact, she named the program. And uh, this was the substantially separate uh, classroom teacher where I first met Jennifer Healy. Um, Jen is highly experienced in not just the field of education, but has the vantage point of knowing all the parts of special education that need to improve here in Middleborough. She's highly competent and capable. She's earned the respect and trust of all of her colleagues. Um, and she has truly a keen ability to rise to any occasion. A motivated self-starter and an excellent communicator. Um, truly, I could not have found a better candidate if I had tried. Uh, she is a true advocate for special education students, and that's always been important to this department. When you select a special education director, there are some communities that go out of their way to find you know, the person who's going to reduce the bottom line um, and, and hold the line. And while, yes, of course, there's, there's a component of this role that involves some fiscal responsibility, but always advocacy of student needs. Um, has, has been the critical point. In fact, that's why the school committee appoints this position, so that this person can truly put their, their best foot forward um, for our children. So I proudly present to you Jennifer Healy, and I would welcome any questions you have. Questions? Rich, go ahead. Sure. Um, I, first, just a quick quick statement, I guess. Uh, I remember during the superintendent interview that we did uh, at the Nichols Middle School, I, I asked Ms. Lyons, um, I think one of the signs of a, of a good leader is, is um, mentoring and bringing up um, other people. And um, I don't mean this at all to say that, that uh, Ms. Healy didn't, you know, of course, fight, fight for everything that she's got. Um, but I remember you specifically said one of those success stories, I think, was Ms. Healy. And so I think for anyone that was potentially worried that we were losing something out of the special ed um, department area of the school, I think it seems like a really good sign that we're, we're not really. Um, and that I think um, Ms. Ms. Lyon's fingerprints are, are going to be all over that still, but with some exciting new, um, new blood. Um, so I guess really my question is, um, I just wondered if, if you could talk just briefly about, uh, Ms. Healy, um, just briefly about uh, what you're looking forward to in, in your new role and maybe just give me one challenge that you're excited to try to overcome. Sure. Um, I think, you know, when I think about this new role and, and this new platform for me, I feel as excited as I did when I was coming out of the classroom to the special ed coordinator position. Um, because it gave me the opportunity to impact and support more students um, than that were sitting in my classroom, albeit I was sad to see you know, that part of my life kind of come to a close, but um, it gave me the opportunity to make that greater impact. And so now with this new opportunity arising, I feel that same excitement um, that I will be able to impact from a larger district perspective and to really have my stamp on the special education department and work with those teachers. Um, I'm really excited to work on continued professional development for our department, um, not only for the special education teachers and staff, <coughs> but also for um, all of our, our staff, our general educators, because as we know, the students you know, who are connected to our department are all our students. Um, 
and they are accessing all the classrooms within each building. So making sure that there is deep understanding of how disability impacts the classroom setting, um, making sure that we are targeting the right things, that we are providing tier one and tier two interventions to um, prevent actually referrals to special education when it's not really necessary. Maybe it's just that these students are requiring a little extra something within the classroom setting itself. Um, so professional development is one of those things, uh, not necessarily, I guess, a, a challenge, but something that I'm really excited to do. I think that's the teacher in me that will never fade, is that I really, really enjoy um, teaching others something new. And so uh, I look forward to not only developing and creating that professional development, but also facilitating it myself. Um, Ms. Lyons mentioned that I am one of the district RISE trainers, and that's by far my favorite part of being a special ed coordinator, um, and something that, to be honest, I'm not willing to give up. So I would imagine that I'd continue to train um, with the RISE program um, with my co-trainer, um, Kim, uh, Kim Redline, rather, <laughs> um, to do that training uh, district-wide. So I'll be looking forward to doing that as well. Um, and then just another area of professional development that I have in mind is focusing on our ESPs. Um, making sure that they have quality professional development. Um, not that they haven't in the past, but I think that sometimes the focus has not always been there. And these are professionals that work so closely with our students. Um, they, they know them you know, in an intimate way that um, we really need to foster and support them because oftentimes their days are busy and, um, and fast and, and hard. And so making sure they have the right supports and resources to do the job that um, we all want them to do. So. Excellent, thank you so much. Sure. Other questions? <clears throat> See, go right ahead. Uh, I guess the question that I have for you is, um, becoming the uh, director of special education, do you foresee any problems uh, helping manage um, your uh, your colleagues and peers? Um, I mean, I think there there's always challenge, right, when you're you're managing colleagues and peers. But um, I think that over the last several years, I have good working relationships. Um, I, I I feel pretty connected to the staff. Um, I've worked now, actually, this particular year, I've covered uh, grades 6 through 12 and um, am the postgraduate program. Um, and I've developed really strong relationships with the staff there. Um, I have really strong ongoing relationships with the existing coordinators in the department and um, have already had conversation about um, my intention and where I'd like to see the department go. Um, so I also feel like I have pretty good communication skills as well. Um, and so navigating any kind of difficulty or um, you know, difference in opinion, I think I'm not significantly worried. Thank you very much. Other questions? Seeing none, then the chairman entertained a motion to appoint Mrs. Jennifer Healy to the uh, special education position of Middleborough Schools. So moved. Second. Discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous and welcome. Thank you. Sean, are we doing pictures? <laughs> <laughs> uh, is that a no? I think that was a no. I think he was asleep. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye, Natalia. Bye, Natalia. See you graduate today. See you, Natalia Nate. Up next on the agenda, I, I, I want to appeal to the committee. We currently have what's called the Strategy for Continuous District Improvement, uh, which you know is the blueprint for uh, basically district improvement, and it's been a five-year plan that's been going on. This started uh, back in, when I was in the new Superintendent's Induction Program. Part of that program is the establishment of this plan and working forward. Uh, now, Carolyn Lyons will be in the new Superintendent's Induction Program. And what I'm asking uh, on, for the committee is that we extend this plan one more year. It's a great plan. It's got a great blueprint. Uh, we have a great curriculum department now to work with that plan. 
uh, extend that plan for a year and give Carolyn Lyons the time to work with the new superintendent's induction program and tweak it or change it completely and move forward with it. So uh, what I'm asking for you is to extend that 2017 to 2022 strategy for continuous district improvement, change the 22 to the 23, um, because nothing really in it is time dated other than, I mean, there's some strong goals in there. So 217 to 223, that's my question for you tonight or my ask. And to make it clear, um, this was this the continuous um, district improvement plan was developed by the current superintendent during his induction plan. Correct. Uh, and, and and the committee and the, the group of, of leaders you see out there. So it, this is not something that was different uh, from the past. So with that, the chair will entertain a motion to extend for a year the current plan. So moved. Do I hear a second? Second. Discussion. Rich. Um, so I'm assuming, and I know we've heard obviously a ton about the, the this particular um, district improvement plan. I'm assuming that any any uh, metrics that are in here would just also push forward. Correct. Um, and I want to be clear, I think it makes a ton of sense to um, to give our incoming superintendent time, and especially with the, like you mentioned, the addition of a new uh, director of curriculum, that it seems like it would be crazy to just end it right now. So um, totally in favor of this. Correct. Any further discussion? Seeing none, anybody in the audience have any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on my agenda is the Meet the New Superintendents update, and that's, I'm going to turn to you, Mr. Chair, for, for some, uh, a summary of what occurred last Sunday afternoon. So, and I know the current, soon-to-be new superintendent will, will be up, but I'd like to thank everybody. Mr. Brennigan did, and Sean did a fantastic job, and uh, Rebecca did a fantastic job with the ice creams. Um, I would say it was extraordinarily nice meeting the new superintendent's husband and children. Um, I would say almost 100 people came, um, and um, some came to meet the new superintendent, and some came because they were excited to walk through this building and see the building. So it was a good mix, and um, everyone enjoyed the ice cream. Some, I will not say any names, enjoyed it many times. <laughs> many, many times. <laughs> so, so, Callan, I'll ask your points about this. Sure. I just wanted to say uh, thank you to the community. Um, I did bring my husband and my two children who clearly fell in love with the high school, Mr. Brannigan. I had to hear about it all the way home. Um, but what I wanted to say was it was a really enjoyable afternoon. It was a pleasure meeting the community. Uh, it helped to have a school to bring crowds in. I think there were many people interested in touring the building, understandably so. But I was struck by, as I reflected on the experience, how much, one, how excited I am for this next step, but two, how much I feel that I belong. And that sense of belonging is a tremendously powerful emotion, uh, let alone when you're taking on a new task, but when you're part of a community. Because when you belong, you feel as though you can accomplish things, and you feel that you have the support of those around you. I share that with you because the sense of belonging, which will not be the last time you hear me talk about it, is something that I really am excited to bring to this community, whether you have a child that attends here, whether you work here, or whether you're a community member. Sense of belonging will always be important to me, and I want to thank the community for, for really modeling that for me in this experience. So thank you. It was a wonderful thank time, you. and yes, the ice cream was very good, although I only had one. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lyons. Uh, next on my agenda, my final item here is a, as you know, when we have uh, equipment that's considered surplus, um, we post it and we have to vote on that it be surplus. Uh, then there's a process I have to go through. I have to offer it to other town departments. And if no town departments want it, I can offer it to other school systems. Um, this is actually a list of 16 what's called overhead projectors which were pretty much a staple in every single elementary, middle school, and high school classroom, probably when all of you went through school. Uh, it was a must have. There were never enough. Uh, light bulbs would blow out and there would be a, it would be a crisis. Um, they were expensive, they got to be expensive. Nobody wanted to touch them because, they were, because they'd blow up. And, uh, but this was a staple of every classroom. It was a staple in the classroom that I taught sixth grade uh, back in the 80s. And it's just something that it's, it's sort of sad to see go and sad to call surplus because I'm looking at it, I'm almost crying. 
Um, but, but these overhead projectors um, are surplus. So uh, I, I need a vote with the school committee to, to, to deem them to be surplus, and then I'm going to try to find a home for them. Um, so, can, so can you remind us? <laughs> Kim, can you remind us what happens when something goes into surplus? Well, when something is deemed surplus by the school committee, it goes to the next step, which is I would offer these, I would take a, a scan this into my an email and send it to all town departments and say, would anyone like any of these overhead projectors? Um, other than the Council on Aging, I don't think anyone will take me up on it. Uh, but I think that it was moving forward. Uh, I think we may be able to find there might be a school or schools that might be looking for the bulbs, they might be looking for the pieces, the teachers that are still using them, fortunately for the district and sadly. Uh, we've moved forward with other technologies that can project items onto a board and take up less space and don't get as hot and the fan has to, doesn't have to be on and the kid next to it with the fan blowing on him sweats all day. Um, but it's one of those things that it's, uh, it's a blast from the past. Do I entertain a motion to declare that surplus? <laughs> Do I have a second? second? For discussion, the only question I have for you is I know they're surplus, but do the books that you needed to adjust so that they could actually <laughs> go on the screen correctly, are they surplus too or is just a... Those, those are the opaque machines. <laughs> okay. And those were very rare also. But now we have other machines that do that very quickly. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none, um, unless someone would like to make a motion to make one a present for Mr. Lynch as a no, going away no, gift. No, no. <laughs> so moved. Believe me, I don't, <laughs> I, I don't have any room in the garage. All, right. All those in favor of declaring them surplus, say aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. That ends my report. Thank you very much. Uh, next item on the agenda is the um, MSBA report on the high school building project. There is a couple of things I want everyone to know. We are in the final stages of construction. Um, as of June, the um, tennis courts and the basketball courts will be built. Um, and uh, once they are put in and set, they can be open immediately. Um, the field is almost done. And sod on the field has been done. And that will be, that will take us two growing seasons to use so we can use that next uh, spring. Two year growth cycle. Two, two seasons. Two seasons. Two seasons. Um, a couple of important things uh, for the community. Um, one is the hope uh, that everything is done by summertime and we are essentially no longer a committee at that point, with a few exceptions. Well, I think there's gonna be a punch list that's still 800 yep. items strong that will continue to be worked on, um, but that will be a much smaller committee to be working with uh, Jim Hutch and Fontaine Brothers and Compass Project Management um, moving forward, so. And um, most importantly this, we are currently with change orders. Um, we had uh, a budget for contingency uh, we abuse 64% of the budget for contingency, but I should point out that includes COVID costs. Once all COVID costs are taken away, um, that'll come off the bottom line. Um, at that point, we will, if, if we take the current COVID costs off that we got additional federal dollars for, that'll mean we used 45.82% of the contingency costs. The, Construction is 99% complete. And I should point out to everyone that we believe the project uh, will fall about $4 million under budget. That's just about right. Um, and that $4 million, con that contingency number is $4 million. And if we only use 45% of it, then that's 2.2 .2 and change that we're not using. And that comes off the total cost of the project. So it's our hope to get, it was our hope to get under 100 million, but we're gonna be darn close instead of the 104, much closer to 100. So um, that's the hard work of the committee 
and I should mention, especially Mr. Brannigan, um, Hutch, Sarah, uh, Brian, and uh, especially Rob DeRosian. Absolutely. For all his work. So we thank them all for that. Any questions about that? Any questions or comments? Mr. Oak. Uh, Mr. Chair, if, if someday, and hopefully that day is not too soon, we do have to talk about additional room for the high school, would it be through that committee or would it be through something brand new? Uh, that committee has a sole focus of building the new high school. Mm -hmm. It would have to, you got to remember if you're adding on, you have to go through another MSBA process and I don't, um, so in the past, so just so you know, we, we built the Nichols with MSBA funds, yeah. we built the kindergarten with MSBA funds, we built this building with MSBA funds. We did the roof at the MEC through MSBA did, funds. And we did uh, something else at the Mary Kay Good and the complex with... Uh, Windows, yes. Um, and the um, MSBA has let it be known, give it a rest. For us? <laughs> For us. Okay. So that I should say. Even though they were wrong about the numbers? Uh, well, well, they, well, yeah, I know I get that, but I think... Um, we, we can get into that at great depth, but um, yeah, All right, we get what you. they did. Thank you, and thank you to to the building committee too. It's um, we the updates have been awesome, and I love hearing that line. Oh, well, until COVID, we were always ahead of schedule and under budget, but we continue the under budget. And thanks to all of you for your service on that committee. In talking, Mr. Chair, in talking with this morning, getting an update from Compass Project Management, and, and in talking with the project director for Fontaine, who's been here throughout. Um, he basically spoke about the fact that they're doing buildings now where they're really impacted uh, through budget for the cost of supplies, the cost of travel, the cost of delivery, um, significantly impacting some of these buildings, so much so that towns are needing to go back and, and readjusting numbers and, and adding numbers to them. So we sort of skated a little <coughs> bit through that. Well, we made it through that first sort of COVID crash that came through and we were fortunate to have Plymouth County uh, support us to the tune of about $834,000 in extra costs associated with COVID that we were completely reimbursed, reimbursed for the town. Um, and that did not occur in all towns. And fortunately we had Plymouth County who in, sort of intercepted that federal money that we originally sort of had a sh we're shrinned because we didn't think we were going to get the $225 per student that other districts received, but we ended up getting a lot more per student throughout the course of the, I think Middleborough topped $2 million in, in COVID money from the Plymouth County. So it really did work out well. Anything else, anybody? Um, with that, I'll move on to consent agenda. Uh, Chair will accept the motion to approve consent agenda except for the May 5th mini meeting minutes. <laughs> Do I hear the motion? So moved. Do I hear a second? Second. Discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Um, <clears throat> Chair, I entertain a motion to approve the May 5th minutes. So moved. Do I hear a second? Second. second. Discussion? Marcy? <laughs> <laughs> Just a quick thing on the May 5th on page 6. Um, there was a misidentification. They're saying, they're saying Sarah Hickey when I, we were talking about Sarah from Calmore Choice. So I think that we just want to um, change that so the identification so, of the right Sarah is on there. So with the change pointed out by Marcy, um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank good you, Marcy, catch. for pointing that out. I was about to say, good catch. Our, um, a couple things are um, our action items are all complete. Uh, we should thank the people from Pilgrim's Pest Professionals uh, because they funded the field trip to Buttonwood Zoo for Mary Kay Good. Uh -huh. So we thank them for that. Um, and finally, I'd like to just point out to the, to the school district at large, uh, we had an executive session this week. Um, we are allowed to speak about um, meeting minutes, uh, meeting times, excuse me, and we decided to change our meetings in June to the second and fourth Thursday of the um, month, primarily because the first uh, Thursday falls in senior week and most of the administrators and some school committee members like to attend senior week activities and so we didn't want to uh, create a problem with that. So our next meeting is June 9th. Um, and so with that, Chair, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Do I hear a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. 
Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you, everybody, and we appreciate it, and have a good night.